I Am With You Murga, an extraordinary dance performance of devotion to the fearsome id of Lord Murgan. Not much is known of Lord Murgan. He is the enigmatic younger, he's the enigmatic younger brother of the popular elephant-headed god Ganesha, who is well known for his role as a scribe of Vyasa's Mahabharata, and he's also well known for his love of Ladus. Muruga, on the other hand, has very few stories. He's the child of Shiva and Parvati. He rides his peacock and carries a terrifying trident. Malaysia is dotted with small temples and shrines in his name, and he stands outside those shrines, three-pronged weapon in hand, waiting for his disciples to throw themselves into his stern and jealous embrace. Every year, Indians in Malaysia celebrate Haipusam, going into trances, piercing their bodies with hooks and spears and carrying their kavadis or offerings for miles in the hot sun to his temple. This very Indian celebration is only found in Malaysia. The show was held at City Hall in what used to be a premier cultural center, a bit like this one, now a little shabby and used mostly for cultural performances of a rather sleepy kind. In its heyday, City Hall had dance and western musicals as well as a smattering of more contemporary work. However, in 2012, a directive was issued that government buildings would no longer be given permits for Indian classical dance or church choirs on the basis that it could not promote work of a religious nature. The decision made very few waves in a country more used to contestations over, for example, the use of the word Allah by non-Muslims in Malaysia and calls by religious leaders to boycott things as important as Valentine's Day. To this, one could add the ad hoc decisions by the government to ban both Erika Badu and the ballet. In the controversy over the use of the word Allah, even the current Sultan of the state of Selangor and the regent of Perak weighed in strongly that the word was strictly for Muslims. However, the directive about the use of government buildings, half-hearted as it was, fed an already smoldering resentment and the further explanation that Nashid groups who sing Islamic religious songs were exempt on the basis that their work was cultural rather than religious. This didn't help. Wasn't a choir a part of Western culture? Wasn't Bharatanatyam and Odyssey central to Indian culture? More importantly, where and what were the divisions between culture and religion? And who in the world was going to decide? Culture, religion and race are practically taboo subjects in Malaysia and therefore the most widely discussed and the most hotly debated. In 2012, Rishad Manji's book, Allah, Liberty and Love, was banned in Malaysia. Her books were taken off the shelves and a young bookshop manager was summoned for questioning by Jawi, the Islamic Religious Department. She had not been part of any uh, purchasing committee, but simply the manager in charge on the night that Jawi officials raided the shop. Amongst other things, it was insinuated that she must be a lesbian, as she was unmarried and working in a shop that allowed the work of lesbian writers. She was charged in the Sharia High Court for distributing and selling the book. The publisher of the book in Malaysia, a man, was also arrested and charged in court, but of course not treated to such humiliating remarks. Also in 2012, a very well-known transgender sex worker passed away in KL, not far from here. People came from all over the world to pay their respects to her in the tiny alleyway where she lived and worked. She was a mother and a matriarch to many sex workers of every race and every religion. A street party was held for her in Lorong Haji Thai. The sex workers were not forbidden from holding the party, nor were they harassed. Yet every year, transgender sex workers die in police custody, or their deaths go uninvestigated by authorities who find it more important to solve the murders of their more prominent citizens. If you go to RTM, the government broadcasting house, you will find that most of the makeup artists there who powder and puff the VIPs and MPs about to go on air are Malay, Muslim, transvestites or transsexuals. Recently, many of them have had to exchange their feminine apparel for more male clothing. But the slacks and t-shirt do not disguise their very obvious sexual orientation. This is part of a very obvious change towards people of a different sexuality 
and an identifying of sexuality as a signifier or a marker of cultural and religious identity. I don't want to say witch hunt, but the expression springs to mind. Early in 2013, a musical, Asbara Song Sang, or Abnormal Desire, premiered at Istana Budaya, or the Palace of Culture. Essentially, this piece is a warning to the LGBT community that they must repent or die. Lesbians are portrayed in vivid tones as being out to corrupt the morals of minors with sex in the streets and multiple partners. A lesbian friend of mine pointed out that the musical was badly researched. We're too jealous to have multiple partners, she said. <laughs> the musical was funded by the government and was free to the public. It is now on a tour of schools and colleges throughout the country because, as its director and writer earnestly explained, they have to take this message to people before it's too late. The play ends with the unrepentant deviants dead and the reformed deviants joining everyone else in a rousing song which celebrates the Prime Minister's slogan, One Malaysia. This musical is aimed at teenage Muslims. The musical identifies homosexuality as a problem and an abhorrent to Islam. Everyone waves toy flags and the audience goes home having had their identities as Malays, Muslims and Malaysians conflated and packaged for them. As a Malaysian, this is all very distressing to witness. Since the infamous 1998 sodomy trials of Anwar Ibrahim, former finance and deputy prime minister and current leader of the opposition, the sexual and political landscape of this country have become entwined. To de discredit and demonize the LGBT community is to de discredit and demonize the opposition and its de facto leader. The fact that Ambika Srinivasan, the popular head of Bursay, a civil rights group demanding electoral reforms and free and fair elections, the fact that she opened a sexual rights festival called Sexuality Madeka, gave the authorities further ammunition to discredit her. Then in a piece of extraordinary circular logic, they claimed that her appearance not only discredited the event itself, but was proof that she was a party to free sex. The implication being that she, like all those who supported their stance, were sexual deviants or supporters of sexual deviancy and the opposition. <sighs> what has all this got to do with my work in Malaysia as a theatre director? Before I answer that, let's return to Maven Koo and his dance invoking Lord Muruga. As an Indian classical dancer, Maven Koo is both male and female. He, is, he sinuously becomes both male and female, transforming before our very eyes. His androgyny is an essential part of the vocabulary of his dance. The dancer seeks union with his Lord, but himself must be all that God creates, and he must be that within his singular body. In the last five minutes of Maven's dance, the veil separating man and God is destroyed. God enters and God dances on stage. It is an extraordinary revelation. The dancer is experiencing ecstasy, the same ecstasy that we find in the devotion of the whirling dervishes. We experience the divine ourselves and we are moved. However, what made the performance even more extraordinary for me was that the patron and the guest of honor that night was the regent of Perak and his wife. He had arrived earlier with his entourage and taken his place in the VIP section. At the end of the performance, he was invited onto the stage to congratulate the dancer and his musicians, and this he did with obvious sincerity. Everybody in the audience applauded and then politely rose to their feet when he and his consort left. This is the same person who said that only Malays can use the word Allah. This is the same venue which bans Indian classical dance. Those are, and these are, the everyday paradoxes of being Malaysian. Last year, I directed a play by a Singaporean playwright called um, Alfian Sa'at. His play, Nadira, deals with the issue of conversion. Sahira is a Chinese, Peranakan, but she's a Muslim convert. A Singaporean of Peranakan descent, she meets and marries her husband, a Malay businessman from Malaysia, with business in Singapore. Eventually they have a child, whom they name Nadira, and they relocate to Malaysia. However, when her husband decides to take a second wife, 
Sahira asks for a divorce, and she returns to Singapore. Now divorced and a single mother, she slips between the cracks. She is estranged from her Chinese family for marrying a Muslim and a Malay. She eventually finds work at, a, at her cousin's hair salon. The customers initially find it funny that she wears a hijab, but she's cutting hair. But eventually they get used to her. Her life is settled, but lonely. Scared that the Malaysian high courts might take away her children, sorry, may take away her daughter, she enrolls her in a madrasa school. Twenty years later, the daughter, Nadira, is a vice president of the Muslim society in her Chinese and Christian dominated university and society. The central conflict in the play, Nadira, is the result of Nadira's mother falling in love with Robert, a Christian widower who, like Sahira, is of Quranican descent. In Singapore, unlike in Malaysia, um, Muslims can opt for a civil marriage with non-Muslims. But it's not an easy choice, as families often are split as a result. For Nadira, her mother's decision to get married in this way, in a civil marriage, is a betrayal. She's appalled that her mother has actually removed her hijab in order to accompany her fiancé Robert to his church. She now questions her mother. She questions her mother was ever, if her mother ever truly believed, if her mother was ever truly, deeply a Muslim. After all, she says to her mother, you're just a convert. At the audition before casting for Nadira, a number of the actors who came to audition actually happened to be of mixed parentage themselves. At one particular reading, a group of them confessed that they had often thought or said the same things to their own mother in anger. You're just a convert, therefore not a true Muslim. Don't you tell me what to do. <laughs> the idea of what it means to be mualaf, or a convert was therefore, and is therefore, a very highly charged and emotive subject in Malaysia. At the performance of Nadira, an older conservative journalist came to see me. He said that while he did not agree with Sahira's choice to marry a Christian, he said he had to admit that our society had failed all our Sahiras. They had abandoned them as much as her husband had abandoned her. And he was disturbed, he said, by these women who had fallen between the cracks. It is the fate of converts whose husbands leave them, he said. Neither side wants them anymore. But he was in a quandary because he did not know what to do either. He wanted to support her, but he felt he could not support a character, even a character in a play, if she had now conver not converted and married somebody of a different faith. At the performance or doing interviews prior to opening night, I was often asked why I, a non-Muslim woman of Indian origin was interested in this play. Surely, they said, it's not your subject. It's not your concern. It's not your story. I live in a country which is multi-ethnic, multi-religious, and on the face of it, deeply pluralistic. Geographically, at a crossroads, it has long had a history of cultural hybridity, as evidenced in various Southeast Asian tradition traditions and traditional art forms, Wayang Kulit, shadow puppetry, tell stories from the Indian Ramayana. However, our Prime Minister, Razak, Najib Razak, has iterated that LBGTs, liberalism and pluralism, are enemies of Islam. With the increasing politicization of Islam, this, I believe, is everyone's concern, including the concern of artists. It is my subject because the dominant narrative in Malaysia is about Malayness and Islam and about cultural identity and Islam. This does not only affect the lives of my Muslim friends, it affects my own lives as I am their friends and as I am increasingly separated from them by policy. In schools, children attend very different moral instruction classes. Increasingly in schools, there are schisms between children where none used to exist. Attitudes are changing at a bewildering rate as you rush headlong into a more conservative, less inclusive state. Pluralism, we are told, is a bad world and our liberal living space is rapidly shrinking. So in Nadira, I wanted to make religion and religious belief something that could be discussed in a public sphere, such as theatre. I staged the play almost as a piece of forum theatre, with the audience sitting very close all around the actors on four sides. The audience were thus able to see each other's reactions as well as the performance of the actors and the story unfolding before them. And it's a very human story 
of how politics and religion can create pain and suffering in the lives of believers of every faith. It was important to empathize with stories not your own, because in some larger human way, all stories of human suffering and of human joy are our own. As an artist in Malaysia, I am constantly negotiating the paradoxes and shifting paradigms of this country. On the one hand, the refusal to allow religious performance, performances in a government and therefore de facto Malay Muslim hall, and on the other hand, the region of Perak honoring such a performance. We often live easily within this paradoxical world. At the same, at other times, however, and increasingly, we simply cannot. Increasingly, I fear that we simply cannot. Of late, these paradoxes have shifted into absurdist theater. When the boss of the bookshop which carried Rashad Manji's book went to pay the bail to secure the release of his unfortunate female manager, he was turned away by the clerk. The reason? He was told that as he was a non-Muslim, the clerk could not possibly accept his money, as it was not halal. In the end, the bookshop owner's driver, who was waiting in the car, had to be invited in to carry out the transaction. All over the country, petty officials are making up similar rules and creating laws where no laws exist. A customs official some years ago confiscated a shipment of Bibles because, as he claimed later, they were contrary to Islam and therefore ought to be illegal. It didn't matter to him that freedom of religion is a tenet of the Constitution. He just dimly feels that it is his right. As politics and politicians weigh in ever more strongly in their last grasp desire to win votes, they know must, they must first win souls. Different parties offer salvation in different forms, but very few are offering dialogue. Increasingly, we speak in the dialogue of the other. You can't understand me, because you are not me. Another play I did last year, and I'm restaging again next month, also at Alfie and Sa'at, called Para, uh, follows a group of school children, best friends, down the slippery slope of racialized thinking, thinking that everyone is the other. From being Kaho, Hafiz, Mahesh, and Melo, they suddenly become Chinese, Malay, Indian, and female. In their adolescent growing pains, they cry, you don't understand me because you are not Indian, you're not Muslim, you're not Malay, you're not Chinese. But eventually we discover they have blocked their ears, they have closed their eyes, and they have turned on each other. They have all made the other of each other. That's why in theatre, I feel the space, the democratic space, is to try to make people see the other, and see them in real human terms, to feel empathy for their plight, to look past race and religion, to feel compassion, feel understanding, feel interest. In the play Nadira, Robert and Nadira's boyfriend, Farouk, initially are hostile to each other. One is a Christian, one is a Muslim. But they find a shared kinship in football. There's only one problem. Robert supports Liverpool, while Farouk uh, supports uh, Manchester United. Farouk tries to persuade Robert to convert, and football serves as a very useful metaphor for understanding. Don't you want to be on the winning side? He says excitedly to Robert. But Robert says he loves his team. He explains when you love your team, you stick to them and you stick with them no matter if you win or lose. And this Farouk understands and he leaves. In Singapore last year, I did a play, uh, a one woman play, um, where amongst the characters, the main character, I played an 80 year old Muslim woman who had lost her husband the year before that. The play tells of how she had met and fallen in love with her husband from a distant rooftop during the perilous days of the Japanese occupation of Singapore. At one point in the play, after the first earth-shattering bomb dropped when the Japanese arrived, she recites the Bismillah in the name of God. Every night I could feel the comfort she derived from reciting those familiar phrases. At the end of the play, in a very beautiful moment, she recites verses from the Quran about the Day of Judgment. She shines, knowing this is when she will see not just her beloved husband, but her beloved God. And every night on stage, reciting these words of devotion, surely it will be but one shout, and lo, they will be awakened. 
every night saying these words in becoming Mr. Siraj, every night I felt what it was to be her and to be close to her God and who was also therefore my God. But in Malaysia, I wonder if one day I will be told that these words are not for me. These are words that only can be said properly by a Muslim. If that were to happen, I feel I would lose what is part of my Malaysian identity. And I feel we will lose, all lose, the ability to empathize with each other with compassion and mercy as human beings. In the name of Allah, the compassionate and the merciful. I hope that day never comes. Thank you.